So yeah, thank you so much everyone for joining today. Really, really excited to get into this session from spreadsheets to databases, a guide to structuring your data with NoLoco. Um, quick bit of housekeeping before we go into introductions um, is that this session is being recorded for those who could not make it at this time. And once everyone's comfortable with that, then great, stay on the line. Um, but yeah, let me just jump ahead into introductions. So for those of you who do not do not know me yet, my name is Jill, not Gil, as that is often the mistake that people make with the spelling of my name. And uh, I head up the partnerships and operations function at NoLoco. So I have the wonderful pleasure of working with our network of certified NoLoco experts and agencies like Ben, who's joining me today. Um, and developing a program for them to help bring NoLoco to a wider audience and reach a bigger customer base. So um, I suppose I'll hand over to our wonderful co-host, Ben, to introduce himself. Ben, do you want to share a few words? Yeah, thanks for the words, Jill. So yeah, my name's Ben. I um, am one of the co-founders at Automation Helpers, and I uh, work with our services team. So it's it's been a pleasure working with you, Jill, over the last six months. We do everything in the no-code space. Um, and NoLoco is one of, one of our preferred uh, front-end and uh, turning to be one of our back-end tools uh, or complete solutions as far as um, doing automations and implementations uh, with our customers. We work mainly with small businesses um, and then with departments within bigger businesses as well. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Ben. And yeah, really excited to have you here today. I can't think of a better person really to run us through this content, which is, of course, all about how can we move away from the world of spreadsheets into the wonderful world of databases and then reap the benefits of a front-end tool or app builder like NoLoco. Uh, but before we dive into the live demo and uh, where Ben is going to show you how you do that, um, I'd love to really hammer home the why behind we're doing this session. So for many of you who are joining in live today and for many of those who will catch up on the recording or see this video on YouTube, you know, we're all probably budding no code enthusiasts uh, somewhat early in our journey of discovering tools like NoLoco and beyond in the no code world. Um, and one thing that we're not taught or real or something we don't realize when we embark on that journey is needing to have your data structured in sort of a relational way as we say or within a relational database and um, you know many of us are coming into no code because we don't have a background in software engineering or coding and yet we have to somehow kind of structure our data in a specific way um, and a lot of us prefer the spreadsheet world right it's a very comfortable environment something we're used to using every day and something that can be spun up really quickly. Um, but I suppose we're here today to kind of discuss a little bit about the limitations of maintaining and staying in the world of spreadsheets. And of course, like the world of benefits, the reaps, the benefits you can reap if you move into the world of relational data. Um, but it's a concept that many don't know straight away. And we want to use this session to really simplify that concept, break it down, and we can breathe a sigh of relief because thankfully we can build databases without writing a single line of code on NoLoco. And that's uh, another thing that maybe people don't realize about NoLoco is that you can, in fact, build your database on our tool as well as the app that is connected to that data. And um, many of us might be already familiar with Airtable and Smartsheet. Smartsheet, also great tools that you can build relational databases on without writing a single line of code. Um, but, you know, this concept or the theory, I suppose, that will be covered in this session can be used and transferred across any sort of tool that you can build an OCO database on. So, yeah, really hope that everyone benefits. Um, and if that's not convincing enough as to why to stay tuned on this webinar for Ben's demo, which is coming up very shortly, I suppose I've categorized kind of four key things. Um, why it would benefit your business, perhaps, um, to move from the world of spreadsheets to databases. And first things first is, look, spreadsheets obviously impose limitations, right? Um, yes, they're familiar. Yes, we're comfortable with them. But as your business starts to scale and grow and you've got more and more team members, perhaps, helping you on that journey, having data exist in multiple different spreadsheets can you know, give rise to silos, it can, you can never be sure how up to date that information is. There's no way to track timestamps, for example, of when the data was last updated at or who was created by. Um, and it can just really in, introduce a lot of like 
data and accuracy, right? Making it hard for you to run your business um, operating off perhaps in inaccurate data. So we really want to hammer home, I suppose, after today's session, the power of structured data and the power of databases and what they can do for you, right? Having a database, of course, eliminates redundancy. It ensures your data's integrity. It means that you can trust that the decisions you're making is based on data that is accurate. And moreover, I suppose you have the ability to give greater access to that data, but yet in a secure and in controlled way. So whether it's across your teams within your business or externally with stakeholders like customers and vendors, you're gonna have a much better way of being able to share that data out uh, once it's stored in a structured database that we will be showing you very shortly. And of course, what does that mean overall? Well, improved business operations, right? Uh, better efficiency across your team, allowing them to update data through an application like Inface. You can use tools like No Local, right, to make your business more efficient. You can build wonderful charts on this accurate real-time information to steer your business um, in the right direction. Um, and that is just really tip of the iceberg stuff of all the great benefits that you could reap from moving from the world of spreadsheets to databases. But yeah, that is the real reason why we're here today. And I think tease up uh, Ben really nicely to now take you through how you can go about that and how can I break free of spreadsheets, um, especially when you're just starting out this journey for the first time, it can be a bit intimidating. So let Ben simplify that concept right down for you today. Um, so yeah, over to you, Ben, for the demo. Yeah, appreciate that, Jill. So um, do you want to enable screen sharing? Ah. And of course, I can do. As we, as we jump into this, I think most of us, or at least most of the, the clients that we work with, are very familiar with spreadsheets. Uh, it's very easy to get started with spread, spreadsheets. And um, using the, uh, like Google Sheets, for example, it's part of the tools that are freely available for, for many people on um, the Google workspace. Or if you're in the Microsoft world, using Excel. So they've been around for 30, 40 years now. So really... Um, really just everyone knows them because they grow up with them and uh, it's very easy for both personal use and then from a business standpoint to put things together. When I first started putting spreadsheets together, one of the big questions I uh, struggled with was how do I structure the data? So with the, the field types, for example, first name, last name, full name, um, I always struggled to know, should I put them in, in the rows and then have the values be in the columns? Uh, and as you get into the business world and you realize that you need to keep track of, you know, not just hundreds, but often thousands or hundreds of thousands of records, uh, the idea of, um, you know, uh, putting the field the fields in the columns just makes a lot of sense. Often we'll have 20 to 30 fields in an average spreadsheet or a table, uh, whereas we could have thousands or, you know, potentially even millions of records. When I was working, I was working with an accounting um, department within a technology company when I first came out of school. And my first project was helping them move from uh, a payment platform on NetSuite to a different payment platform. And they were doing it with databases. And I was uh, the data analyst that was ensuring the data integrity. So I had to export the data from uh, from the, the SQL database and pull it into Excel, and I think there was like three or four million lines of rows that I was analyzing. And spreadsheets are great for that, like really great to look at data quickly, uh, make the adjustments, run the analysis on the data. Um, but as as I progressed in, in my career and started building out applications, I realized that um, spreadsheets aren't the way to scale a company or to scale the, the operations in a business. Um, and with a lot of the companies we work with, you know, when you first start, you need to get things done quickly. And so putting a CRM together, for example, really easy to do in, in Google Sheets. Um, Google Sheets is really extensible. There's a lot of ways to connect other systems, especially through like Zapier or Make, um, to pull in, you know, emails or contact information from other systems. Um, but what often happens is when companies get to a handful of employees and their operations are starting to scale and, and instead of dealing with 
you know, just a handful of customers and a handful of, of companies that they're working with, the data structure gets too much to handle. It's something that you can't just keep in your head um, because across the company, when you have six, seven people working together, uh, it's not like you can tell everyone when you make an update to a spreadsheet. Whereas when you're just by yourself or uh, a couple of people, it's very easy to just shoot a note and say, hey, I've updated this account or I'm, I'm working you know, with this company at, at this time. And so there's a concept with spreadsheets uh, and databases called normalization. And I guess the opposite of normalization would be denormalization. And so in, in spreadsheet land, we often have a view that's that's denormalized. And the idea of denormalization is that all of the information exists in one sheet or in one table. So you can think with the CRM, we're keeping track of a company. Uh, we're keeping track of contacts plus the company. But oftentimes there's a lot of additional information that we may need to keep track of um, in regards to the company as well. So maybe the billing contact and the address of the company and uh, the phone number for the, the company, you might have a logo. And in a denormalized table, we would have a column for each of those fields uh, for the company. And in spreadsheets, that, that tends to work okay um, until you get to the point where there's a lot of companies and a lot of a lot of people that you need to keep track of at those companies, because what tends to happen at the beginning is the idea is like, okay, let me just create a new sheet for this different customer type, or you know, instead of a customer, let me keep track of vendors. And so you end up creating some companies that we've worked with have four or five different tables to keep track of people. Um, and they're storing the same information about uh, each of those people, even though some might be vendors, some might be like an appraiser. Um, we work with a lot of financial services companies. And so um, on, a, on a loan, you may have an appraiser, you may have a borrower, you may have members of a company that are the, the borrower on the loan. And so you have four or five different entities that you need to keep or uh, types of contacts that you need to keep track of. And doing so in a, a spreadsheet, we can do it with a denormalized view, but the problem in that case is for this company. So like, let's say Fidel LLC has uh, five or six people at that company that we need to keep track of. Um, if we needed to update any of that information, we'd have to make that update in every location where Fidel LLC occurs. So it, it becomes very cumbersome uh, to do that. So the first step in migrating from a spreadsheet to a, a database um, environment is to take a look at your data structure and to see how to make it normalized. And the idea of normalization is, is pretty simple. It's just grouping everything that's um, of the same information or the same type together. So a good example of this would be to take the CRM that we just had where we were keeping track of vendors and uh, keeping track of customers and combining them into one table and then separating out the account information into a separate table. Uh, because with the, the vendors and the customers, the information is going to be very similar. Um, you'll, you'll have a role. Each person would have a role at the company. Uh, there's also a company associated with the, the contact. Um, and then maybe there's an internal um, employee, like an account executive or a customer success manager that's assigned to the, the contact. And so by combining everything into one, the relationship between uh, the vendor and the customer and the company, instead of having um, two different relationships for the company, it now just becomes one. So instead of connecting to the vendor and to the customer, the company now just has one relationship with the contact. And so this makes it easy because um, in, in a world where the tables are connected or the sheets are, are connected together, uh, we can update the company name in uh, in this row, and it will propagate to all other areas of the, the system. So normalization um, just makes the data uh, simpler to manage over the course of time when you have um, a lot of records and a lot of connections to, to multiple tables. Because in a business, you may start with the CRM, but then there's projects that you need to add. Um, and then there could be other connections to payments and invoices. And so as the complexity of the system grows, having a normalized system keeps it easy to manage and update um, as you, you go through the business. Brilliant, Ben. Quick question for myself, right? For the audience almost. 
to think about. So what we're seeing here, of course, is the normalized version of the previous spreadsheet. And I suppose the question would be is, for somebody embarking on this journey for the first time, um, you know, how much time would you say they should invest in, I suppose, normalizing their database? And, you know, how important, I suppose, is the planning before, let's say, taking the next step, which would be migrating to a database? How much time do you think they should probably think about that for the for, for a complete beginner, let's say, starting on this journey? So the beginning stages, if you're tackling it by yourself, it may take a while to um, to analyze your data structure. And we'll talk about um, how to analyze your data structure here in a second. But I'd say just a couple of hours to, to look at your data structure and to normalize it if it's not normalized yet is really all you need. The, the bulk of the work comes when you take your denormalized tables in the sheet or the denormalized sheets and convert them to a format that can be imported or migrated into a, a database system like NoLoco. Brilliant. Okay, cool. And I know you've got a cool diagram to show as well in a moment that will hopefully kind of help people with that normalization exercise to show. So yeah, yeah. that. Cool. I don't want to jump into but any other questions before we jump into no no that was just one that kind of came to my head um i might i might jump in every now and again with a few more but uh, <laughs> yeah let's definitely dive into the the schema you have here it's cool so when when you're using a system a database system uh, and you want to look at the tables um going through and trying to analyze every field and understand how they connect together can be fairly difficult so having a diagram to to do that um, just really helps in understanding how the, the data is structured overall, especially as it becomes more complex as the business grows or you become more automated. Um, and there's diagrams like UML that can explain the relationship in detail, but something as simple as this that just has the, the table. So in this case, the accounts or the companies that uh, we want to keep track of. Um, and we have the different fields that we need uh, of information that we need to keep track of with the company. And then with these diagrams, it shows the relationship between the accounts and the contacts. And as we get into the, the setup in NoLoco, with each of these tables, there's a, a certain type of relationship between them. Um, there's and really there's three different types that you can have. So the, the first is one-to-one. -one. So an account could have one contact and then a contact could have one account. Uh, that's it's fairly infrequent that you see a one-to-one -one relationship because if you have a one-to-one -one relationship, you could just take all of the fields and move them into one table and uh, merge the tables together uh, to, <laughs> to simplify the structure. Sometimes it's helpful to, to separate that out. Um, and in the case of the financial services companies that we work with, uh, sometimes you'll have a contact and then um, not every contact would have a... Um, say a borrower profile, but it, you can extend the contact table by creating a borrower profile. And that relationship would be one to one, um, or I guess it could be zero to one or uh, one to zero, but it's um, it's fairly infrequent that you would need to do that. The more common relationship is a one to many. Um, so in the case of accounts and contacts, for example, an account can have many contacts because you can imagine there's multiple people that work at companies mm -hmm. uh, in, in most cases, but in the case of a contact, they should only have one account because um, if someone worked at five or six companies, it would get rather confusing. So in that case, you would likely just create a new contact record for that person and associate them with the account that they, they work at. And that one-to-many relationship keeps it uh, fairly simple. That way in the accounts, in, in Noloco, it, this is done automatically. So we're gonna get into um, how that works, where if you create the data structure in the right way, you can view it very simply with what's called a related record. So you can display all of the contacts for an account um, within NoLoco. So that one-to-many is the most common uh, relationship that you'll have between tables, and it makes it really easy to work with the data and to expand the data out, um, right. uh, the data structure as it grows. And then the last data type is the, the many-to-many. Um, so with the contacts and the activities, an activity could be an email or a phone call that um, mm -hmm. I could have with a, a contact. And so with an activity, with an email, you could have uh, a two uh, field, and then you could have multiple people CC'd on the email. Um, and so 
An activity can have mul multiple contacts or many contacts. And then a contact obviously is going to have multiple activities. You could have a call and um, a few different emails with, with a contact. And so that relationship between the contact and the activities is many to many. Um, one of the one of the things I found with no code tools like no loco, um, having that many to many relationship, um, it, whenever that comes up, it's worthwhile to take a second to think through it, because in with databases like Postgres or SQL on the back end, uh, often with normalization, you'll want to split those tables apart and have a third table which is called the junction table to take that many-to-many -many relationship and turn it into a one-to-many. But with no-code tools like NoLoco, that many-to-many -many relationship, um, it isn't as difficult to work with as it is in, in something like a SQL database. Um, so in the case of like the contacts and activities, um, the way that we have it set up, this is our actual setup in our CRM. And we've just left it as a many-to-many -many relationship because they're um, isn't many downsides to to doing that. Whereas with um, a, a bigger system like you know, Postgres, if you're setting it up in, in a custom way, uh, they recommend to keep those tables normalized and not have those many to many relationships. So as you're you're doing it, it's just something to think through and, and how you want the relationship between the tables. And if necessary, um, sometimes it's helpful to split it out. The the one uh, the recommendation that I would have to split out a many to many relationship is if you want to be able to see the records specifically for um, just one uh, one contact and, and keep the data structure clean. But for most cases, that that's not needed. Um, you can keep that many to many relationship as it is. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Ben. That was really really a lot of information there. Really good information there. Um, and I love what you're showing here, which is a really cool sort of like data schema or UML diagram. And, you know, this is, of course, powered by Smart Suite for those eagle eyed viewers on the call. Um, but, you know, even if you were doing an exercise, I think, for no local, right, moving from spreadsheets to no local tables, which we'll show you very shortly. Um, you could easily recreate one of these in your planning phase on a tool like Figma. Google Jamboard is also a free tool if you're a Google user. Any sort of kind of whiteboarding tool that allows you to kind of add boxes and draw lines um, and be able to just break out your tables, right? Especially for those of us that may just have one monstrous spreadsheet that has, as we saw earlier, a contact record with all the company information as well on the one row. Um, when you're kind of going through that exercise for the first time, which obviously might take maybe a couple hours or maybe, maybe just a day, depending on how fast you move, right? is just being able to kind of figure out how I break them out into logical groupings. Um, so if you're not using Smart Suite and maybe using no local tables, you could definitely recreate, I suppose, a diagram like this using any sort of whiteboarding tool, right, Ben? So um, yeah, definitely one to yeah. kind of maybe refer back to if you're applying this in your own world, maybe your example isn't a CRM example. Um, and on that note, if anyone wants to pop in the chat, you know, maybe their app use case that they're you know working on at the moment um throw it in and we might be able to kind of you know draw some examples and relate this a little bit more throughout the session um crm is a pretty universal one so that's why we chose that and um, most people are familiar with the concept of accounts contacts activities and all and all of that jazz so um yeah but feel free to kind of add that in the chat if anyone is tuning in and wants us to kind of give an example in your area but uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for that, Ben. Um, is there anything on this piece you want to add? Um, what's, what's your next stop? Or is it a good time to pause for questions? Or do you have uh, one or two more things to add first? Yeah, yeah, this is a good time for questions. And uh, if anyone has any questions as they're putting them in the chat, um, to before we get into the actual build in NoLoco, uh, diagramming this out, is fairly quick like uh, jill was saying it, it's not like it takes days to do and mm -hmm. it's it's like building a house before you would build a house there's uh, there's the blueprints that you need to put together to know how to construct it and really these uml diagrams are a good way to know how to to structure the database um, and to maintain the database over uh, the course of time so uh, it's like a couple hours a couple hours of investment here really saves a lot of time down the road as you're migrating from Google Sheets to a, a database system uh, and then 
maintaining that database as it as the company that you're working at or uh, the project that you're working on tends to grow. Yeah, uh, great shout. Actually, that actually almost sparked a question in my head, right? Just what you mentioned there uh, around saving time down the line, right? When you do some forward thinking planning. Um, and I suppose maybe a question that the audience may have on that topic is, you know, can you give maybe some examples of like good database design um, early on and what it can like allow you do in the app, let's say the app building experience later on, that is something that maybe the average user might not think of right away and they get to the later stage and they go, oh, I haven't built my table in such a way to be able to use, I don't know, a certain feature. Are there any sort of things that you can draw on there that the audience might want to know about at this point? Yeah, so one that we'll talk about today is the, uh, if your database design is really clean, then the, the UI building experience is really easy in the logo because it happens automatically. It'll take that data structure and it will give you a view out of the box on, on seeing and, and being able to create records or create entries in your database. Um, so if the database design is like the foundation, if you have your foundation great, then it's easy to put up the walls and the roof of uh, your application. Whereas if you start with a bad foundation, you're going to have to come back and fix it anyway, which means that you're going to have to restart on, mm -hmm. on the front end as far as the view and the, the creation of the records. Um, so that's really the most important thing is, is the experience of building it out. But then even downstream from that, and I think we'll talk about this in, in the next session that we have, is the data will also determine the, the metrics and the dashboards that you put together as a company. Mm -hmm. And so having clean database design will make the, the dashboards, again, in NoLoco, that's out of the box. And so if, if the database design is set up well, then the, the dashboards will um, just be a natural derivation from the data that exists in, in the system. So at some point or another, um, you know, the companies and the clients that we've worked with, uh, if they, they generally will start a build and then um, they'll keep building and all of the tables will exist. And oftentimes the, the data in the tables works well, but the relationship between the tables um, isn't set up in the most optimal way. Um, so sometimes it's it's helpful to just have an expert come in and and uh, take a look at your schema to say actually it'd be it'd be worthwhile to split this out into a, a different table. So a good uh, example is with users um, having your internal users and external users in the same table may make a lot of sense because the information that you're going to store is is similar with both of them. But when it comes to the relationship between the internal users and the external users. Um, oftentimes there's links to the same tables. So with an account, for example, um, there the contacts may exist at the company uh, and then there might be an account owner internally at the company. And so splitting the users table into external users and internal users keeps that relationship between the account or, or the company really clean. Mm. And so, Knowing that up front and having an expert that's gone through it, you know, 10, 15, 20 times mm -hmm. uh, can be really helpful to save time down the road because once you have live data in the system and you need to split the tables out and reconfigure the, the, the system, it takes more work, you know, just as if you were to lay the foundation and realize, mm -hmm. hey, it, it wasn't set properly. Um, yeah. You have to rip the foundation out, which just takes more work than doing it right the, the first time. Exactly. Yeah, I totally relate to that from uh, as being a relatively new no code entrant <laughs> in the last two years. You know, I would have I learned a lot of things along the way and things that maybe I didn't know off right off the bat. But uh, trial and error, that's what it's all about. And uh, the, the good thing is that we can all build databases, even if we get them wrong, uh, maybe right out the door, but we can improve and hone the skills and, you know, have the optimal database by the end. Hopefully, by the you know we'll get you a step closer to that by the end of today's session by talking about some of these questions um, and ideas. But I actually see one question come through that we'll answer now, and then we might dive into the live demo, Ben. But I actually think it's a really great question. Um, so the question is, how should we think about records that can update? So records that can change, right, over time in terms of the information that's stored in them. 
and wanting to use the information that is offered when the relationship of records are formed. So for example, um, shipping records will want the address that an item was shipped to and not always the most recent address for let's say the account. So, you know, um, I think it's a really, really good question. Um, I, I don't mind taking this or if you want to take it, take it. What are you thinking, Ben? <laughs> yeah, hear your thoughts first, because uh, this is a common use case, right? Of, of data that yeah. will be updating, but you need a snapshot of that data. Yeah, so I, I, and I, I'd be interested to hear both our takes on it because we might kind of interpret it differently. But from, from what I kind of see, it's almost like the example given where it's like shipping records, right? So you might be shipping an item, let's say to this account for example a customer account and that shipping record may have occurred let's say january um 2023 and we would have shipped an item to that customer and the address at that time would have been let's say dublin when i used to live in dublin right um and now i'm a customer that lives in cork so when i go to let's say maybe place an order for an item I'd hope that it would, you know, send to my new address and not my Dublin address. Okay. And I, so what it kind of identifies for me is that you're of course going to have me as a customer, right. Sitting up here and having an address value that can change over time. But what you're actually creating is a shipment record, right? So when I place an order for an item and um, that needs to be almost like a, a one-to-many relationship, right? Uh, one customer can have many orders, and at the time that the order record was created, it probably pulled the value from my customer account record, which is address, and it would have populated my Dublin address at the time. And um, now fast forward a year later, you create a new, you've updated this customer record with your new address because you've, you know, the customer maybe had logged into the portal in Noloco to do that because she wants to make sure, I want to make sure that orders, future orders go to my right address. And then when you create that shipment record, which then pulls, you know, related fields values from the customer account at the point of creating that shipment record, it will pull that updated address because Jill updated it in July, 2023, seven months after she moved to a new address. So it's a really great question. Um, what it identifies is that you need one to many relationships. You're gonna have that customer with many shipment records. And then maybe, you know, maybe in part two, I would say of this one of this two part series, we could show you how action buttons can pull in related um, field information from other records at the point of creating a child record, which would be in this case, a shipment record. Um, but that is exactly why we would use something like a database with an app connected on top perhaps a client portal so customers can give you that information themselves. You don't have to go knocking on their door to ask for it and ensuring that you are, are always operating off the most up-to-date information. But it's a really, really good question. Um, but that would be my take on it, Ben. I don't know if you've anything to add or... <laughs> yeah, so the I think another common use case that's similar to that, that uh, shipping address is with like project templates. So when kicking off a project, um, Oftentimes, especially in the construction industry, there's uh, some set like floor plans or or set projects that need to happen. And so we'll take a template and that template will exist in the database and we'll just copy all of the tasks for that project over into the live project. So the, the project is an instance of a project type that exists in the database. Uh, right. So another great reason to use no logo is because those automations <laughs> exist with uh, yeah. could be an action button or some other workflow on the back end um, to to make that data move over in in the right way and to pre pre populate pre fill that data on the creation of a record. Um, another use case this is kind of it's a similar but different one is mm -hmm. in uh, with the financial services companies that we work with um, if they're giving a loan, for example, they have default interest rates that are applied to, to all of the loans and they can adjust those interest rates. So it's similar in the sense that the interest rates are tracked in a table, mm -hmm. but the interest rates are also changing over time. So similar to the, the shipment record. Yeah. And during a uh, when a loan is processed, they need to capture the snapshot of, you know, not just the interest rate, but all of the details of the loan when um, that that loan is being processed. And so we actually, instead of, you know, copying that information over and just having, you know, say a, a contact with 
um, a shipping address in that one to many relationship. Um, the, the interest rates, it's actually a many to many and each, um, each interest rate is stored in the, the table itself and then linked to the, the loan application. So another right. similar use case, but uh, I think it fulfills the the idea of and the benefit yeah. of having a database where it can simplify the, the relationship between uh, yeah. the field. That's a really cool example. Um, and on that example, is that, mar is that, let's say, interest rate being updated by the market? Is it updated externally to where it's stored, like in real time, or as that data changes every day? Or how does that work? Yeah, and I, I guess there's even a third layer where the uh, the interest rates change daily, but then there's also like a company interest rate that uh, mm. that could exist. The over that can override the market. So with databases, yeah. like every use case is a bit different. And yes, of course. I think that's but it's, it's it's a great to kind of highlight some of the examples right because some people can probably maybe relate that to something they're doing in their own world but it also just highlights another benefit right of using a, a, a database is of course we may touch on it today but no local can be integrated to a whole plethora of tools through make.com or zapier and um, with that then you can kind of update things like interest rates from another system um, as they change, right, every day. Um, so that's more kind of market data or real-time data external to your system. And the earlier example was more kind of dependent on the, the human being, right, and how that changes. So the person moving address. So um, yeah, some two good examples, um, I suppose, of data that changes and ensuring that it's updated and having the, data, the benefit of that database in place to be able to track that over time. So yeah, brilliant, I love it. But uh, yeah, I think that's all our questions right that we have right now. So if you want to, yeah, take us take us into the next section, which is no local tables. <laughs> so hopefully the view here on the left is similar to what we saw. So the users um, are going to be internal users, and then contacts will be the the external contacts, similar to what we saw in the Google Sheet. Um, and then we have the accounts or the companies. Mm -hmm. um, so with accounts, I have the data pre-populated. Mm -hmm. um, and what we'll do is go through the process of, of uh, migrating or uploading the data uh, from the Google Sheet to the contact. And the end result that we'll get at, so we have the accounts listed here. And you'll see now that the accounts are tied to the, um, the contacts, but there's no contact records, right? We need to migrate those, those records in mm -hmm. for us to see details. Um, and once we have them migrated in, um, the, this is really, there's a lot of great benefits of using NoLoco, but one of the, uh, I think the best benefits is like, we'll have, this view was created automatically. I haven't changed any of the details. This um, is a representation of the data in the database system that NoLoco gives us automatically. Mm -hmm. So there's a few ways to import data. Um, so if we were to create a new source, we could import it straight from a file. I have the table created, um, already. And the reason is, uh, I think with the imports in, in NoLoco, um, it doesn't allow us to connect the records uh, between tables. But if we have the table created, then when we do the import, we can um, we can associate the records between the tables in the right way. Um, so what I'll do, I'll go ahead and just import the... So yeah, just to recap, you've basically created the shell, right? The schema is the technical term, um, which you can see in this preview here, each column is, um, you know, a field, right, in, in a database, it's going to become a field, and each row is a record, right, so you're, you've basically copied what's in your spreadsheet, you've gone into NoLoco, you've created the table, and you've created all of the columns, so that now the spreadsheet data has, like, a home to go to, so yeah, I just wanted to kind of recap what the audience are seeing as it's probably the first time for most people. But yeah, do you want to take us through, I suppose, what's going on in this preview modal? Yep. So this allows us to see how the data from the spreadsheet will map to our no logo collection. Um, so the fields that I had, had created, uh, it's exactly the same as what we have in the spreadsheet. So first name, last name, email uh, for the contact. And then with NoLoco, the way that we'll associate the, the contact record to the account and to the, the internal users uh, 
is we, we need to reference the ID number of the, the account. Mm -hmm. um, so I added another field here to, um, to reference the company ID. And then uh, I have this, this company field that's created already. Mm -hmm. um, now when we pull the data in, it'll map to the account that already exists in the logo. And I believe it'll be the same here where we have, say, the assignee. So the, the internal um, account executive that's assigned to the account, um, it, it's a similar thing where we have the ID of the, the internal employee here in this table. Um, and then there's the sign update that I'll map to the created at field that, that's given to us automatically in, in Noloco. And we'll go ahead and start the import. So if your data is fairly small, there's only a couple hundred records in in my um, spreadsheet. So mm -hmm. if we refresh, it should should show up, and you see the data from the spreadsheet that um, we had viewed here that we had created in Google Sheets, and it maps to the role of the company and uh, the assignee, and so. Uh, everything is is connected together now. So this process generally takes um, a bit of, of massaging the data to get it to fit um, mm -hmm. from the, the spreadsheet that you currently have. Maybe it's moving some of the fields around as you're normalizing your, um, your spreadsheets into a, a way that we can import the data in the right way. So nice. generally what we, we tell clients is to plan, you know, 10 to 15 hours for this process of, of moving data from your spreadsheet to uh, to Noloco to have it be all organized together. Um, of course, that can be more if you've built quite a bit out on on your spreadsheets, or you know, if you just have a, a handful of spreadsheets, it can go fairly quickly. Brilliant. Now, I think we have about fifteen minutes left, right? And we'll give like five minutes at the end for questions as well. Based on what's left to demo, um, so there's no pressure on answering this question live or not, depending on time, right? So that's what I'm checking in on. Um, but could you would you be able to show very briefly, you know, obviously we you imported the accounts first, right? That was the easy part. But of course, contacts linked to accounts based on that ID number. So could did you do anything kind of clever in your spreadsheet to kind of get the ID value um, for those contact records when before that import exercise that you did. Um, do you have time to go through that very briefly? Yeah, so if you're doing it for the first time, it's it's pretty simple uh, because yeah. the row number should associate to the account. Um, you can see I had to do this a number of times because it <laughs> uh, created, uh, I think it was like six or seven iterations that I went through to, to make sure that the fields were mapping properly. Okay, yeah, of um, course. <laughs> Trial so and error. I, that's fine. So yeah, we automatically uh, apply an ID. That's what NoLoca does behind the scenes for anyone tuning in, but that's great, yeah. So you did that much, and then what next? So as long as the ID matches the, uh, the ID in the spreadsheet matches the ID in NoLoco, it'll work. So I, I just had to make sure that the ID started in uh, the right place. So I believe with 146 account records, Yes. Go to the end of the, the list here. Um, uh, what I did is I pulled the the first ID. Uh, I think this last page should have it. So the first ID was 585. And so with Fidel LLC, I mm -hmm. created another version where I, I just said, um, yeah, my company ID. Yeah. And so I started at 587 or whatever the number was. Yeah. And then just dragged it down. So as long as you have this number in there, yeah, um, it, it, it'll import and connect um, in the right way. Yeah, brilliant. And then you can start using that value and matching it across other sheets when you see that company name and stuff like that. So um, brilliant. Yeah, I just think it's really important to kind of show that um, as it may be a bit of a question mark for some people um, on how to go about it, but really simple, really straightforward once you have the first set of records, right, imported to NoLoco with the ID value. So that's great. Thanks for showing us, showing up Ben. Bit of a curveball I threw at you there. <laughs> yeah, no problem. If anyone has questions on that, of course, we can answer at the end. We'll give five minutes. But yeah, yeah. back to you, Ben. <laughs> so to show the record, we now see the contacts um, in the account view, but then we can also just add the contact view and all of the data that was imported um, now shows in this view. So uh, really simple to set up the, the interface. And you know, if we need to now create a new contact, we have, 
have a form that's given to us automatically that has all of the fields um, that we can we can populate that data. Um, and in, in the account, we have the collections. I, I think I have some that there's multiple. Yeah, you can see some where there's multiple contacts that are associated with the account. So with that, um, take a few minutes and, and we can build out a table from scratch together. So with our CRM, um, maybe we hadn't built out the activities table previously because it's difficult to connect that information um, to Excel, but with NoLoco, you know, using Make or Zapier, we can um, take our Gmail account and send all of the emails into, um, into our CRM here in NoLoco. Um, so I'll go ahead and create an activity table. And to show you how to create or, and connect tables together from scratch, we'll add a few fields. So I'll, I'll add like um, a two email. There we go. And then with the text field, we can say that this is going to be an email so that it can give us validation around the, the field. So we'll create the two email, we'll create the from email in the same way. And then at this point, we may want to connect it to a contact. So when the email comes through, we want to associate it with a contact record that exists in the database. So there's a field type called link to another record or a linked record field, and we can tell it to um, to be associated with the contacts record. And once we select that, there's a few other options that show up. So when we were talking earlier about that one-to-many, the many-to-many -many relationship, that's how uh, it, it's set up here in the logo is if I check this box, what this is saying is that um, if both of these are checked, then the relationship will be many-to-many. Uh, -many. If both are unchecked, it means that it will be a one-to-one. -one. And then if we check one of these boxes, then it will be uh, a one-to-many relationship. So uh, something to be aware of as you're setting up your table is, is thinking through the relationship that you want each, uh, each of the records to have between the tables um, and making the appropriate selections here as you're, you're doing that. So in this case, we'll check both boxes to have uh, the many to many relationship that, that we had seen in the data schema diagram. And then we'll go ahead and just put the activities here. And um, it's as simple as that. So with the, the field types, so like let's, uh, oftentimes we'll keep track of the provider, whether it's like Gmail or Outlook, um, but there's multiple different field types that we can use, like a single select. So that that's what allows us to say whether the contact is, uh, or the account is a vendor or a customer or um, a, a borrower or a third party. Um, so these these single select options or the multiple select options are are just really helpful or like duration when um, doing time tracking that's another common use case. Um, so as you're you're going through, NoLoco gives you a lot of options as far as how to set up the the tables and the fields um, as you're you're creating them. And from here, now that we have the activities table correct uh, created. Um, with the activities, it's really, really only beneficial to see them with a contact. So I'll go through the process quickly of, um, of just changing the display. And we're going to create a split view. And what mm -hmm. this split view will allow us to do is uh, if I click on one of these records, um, we can now pull in related records so that we can see the details around a specific contact. And if I add a collection here, we can say that um, this should be an activity. We don't have any records in there right now, but if I click like add a view, mm -hmm. um, it'll give us a way to add an activity and go through the process of um, when you are accessing it from that, that customer record, the new activity that's created will automatically associate the activity with the customer that's selected. So okay. With NoLoco, I mean, just in a few minutes, you can uh, not only create the interface, but uh, customize it in a way that makes it easy to mm. um, to view and, and and see all of the information that, that you need to see um, around a, a specific record and have them related together. Whereas yeah. in Google Sheets, in order to, to make this happen, um, one, I, I don't know if it 
if there is a way to make it as simple as this and connect it to a front end uh, like no logo, but you know, even in the spreadsheet view, you'd have to use a combination of uh, V lookups and you know duplicating <laughs> some data. Whereas here in no logo, it's um, it's really just automatic, and uh, you know, and you spend the time formatting the data as opposed to thinking, oh, how am I actually going to get this to work and and to make it uh, viewable. So. exactly that's it yeah it's completely um, a new world when you first dive in and you know small things that you just take for granted now living in the world of no local for for so long you know adding a activity record is like as ben mentioned going to automatically link it to a new thing in this scenario and uh, whereas before you'd be filling a row in your spreadsheet and adding all that context every single time you enter that record into your spreadsheet it's just automatically linked and much easier to kind of navigate in and out of records that are related to one another with just a simple click and uh, rather than navigating through multiple spreadsheets or tabs so yeah no i think that's a really good example just to show a little bit of the front end app um so yeah, thanks for that, Ben. Um, is there anything else you'd like to demo before we dive into questions or are you happy to kind of jump into that now? Yeah, yeah cool. let's, uh, let's dive into questions. Um, Great, yeah. And we have just about seven minutes left and we definitely want to take about a minute or two of everyone's time just to kind of tee up what's going to be in the next session and kind of recap some of the stuff that we showed during today's demo. But we've got one great question in here that I'm going to read out to you now, Ben. Um, and I think this is sort of a call back to that kind of um, import exercise that we did earlier where we had the contacts imported into the table and we had the ID values already sort of um, linking the contact to the create, create account. So that's sort of what the timing of when the question came in. And the question is, will the company ID and let's say attendee ID find their references if the data, for example, company name are exactly the same. So um, do you want to start with that one? And I have a few thoughts myself, Ben. Yeah. So in Noloco, it, the, it's the IDs that need to match. Yeah. So yeah, for now, um, making sure that you have the ID that in your spreadsheet, matching the ID in Noloco is going to be important to make that, that import working properly. Yeah, exactly. It's just a far more robust way of being able to make sure that this data is in fact meant to be link linked with another record. Name can sometimes be a little bit too loose or not unique enough. Um, however, there is one feature in the local called automatic links. If you want to actually just like we can briefly quickly show it if you were to just create a new field on even the account table or whatever table. Yeah, try the activity table and just call it. Yeah, uh, yeah, perfect. And if you jump down to the link to another record, you know, we can make use of, if you just pick any record really, they automatically link these records. So you could have it in such a way that email is a good example or ID. So if exactly the email address on the activity record you're creating matches the email address of the of a user in the user table that we could automatically link. Um, it's kind of a very rough example that we're kind of coming up with on the spot, but there is that feature. There are certain use cases where that makes sense to use that. However, the former that we discussed, which is having the ID value of the record that it should be linked to that already exists in the database. That's the key piece there. It is best to use that approach and doing that kind of preparation in your spreadsheet beforehand pre-import to make sure that you've got the right links there. Um, but if you have any more questions on that, you can give us a shout after today's webinar um but that actually at the moment is the last question we have um for today um so i think it might be a good time to perhaps maybe recap some of the things you've shown today ben i can um put up a slide and then we can tee up i suppose what's to come in part two of this two-part series so um let me get open let me get the slide deck back open. Where is it gone? Here we go. Okay. So here you are. Over to you, Ben. So when it comes to databases, um, I think that the use case that I was describing when most most of our clients, when they get to five or six employees and uh, the the data structure that they, they need to have to manage the business 
uh, becomes more complex. That's that's the main reason people start thinking about moving to databases. But some other things that may not be as apparent, at least uh, initially, is as far as record permissions go, um, you can think if you are if you have a customer portal and you want them to be able to enter in and uh, access information, so that way they're not having to email you to get a, a status update on your project or um, mm -hmm. you know any updates then having the record permissions makes it really powerful. Um, and in Excel, there is ways to get around it, but um, the permission would apply to everybody. Uh, whereas in NoLoco, you can get down to the field level and say, um, people with this role can only access this data or they, they can only create this data. And so it's much more robust when it um, comes to a database system in, in order to give the right people the right information at the right time. Mm -hmm. uh, and on top of that, with, as far as duplicating information, like we were discussing with the normalization and the denormalization, with a database system, having all of the information in, in one table, you make an update once, and then it propagates to um, every other table that's that's linked. Because NoLoco is using, when it has a linked record, it's using the data from the table as opposed to a copy of that record. Whereas with Google Sheets, in order to do that, you would have to denormalize the data. Um, and the process of updating data in multiple places is tends it's too cumbersome once uh, you get to a certain size. Um, and then, as far as the system overall having, uh, as, as we were walked through, uh, being able to say that an email is an email and have that data validation on on the type makes it really easy when you're creating records. Um, to enforce that validation, to make sure that, um, that, that your users are actually inputting an email address. Um, if uh, if anyone spent a lot of time in, in Google Sheets or Excel, uh, the biggest problem is data cleanup. So ensuring that the data is all of the same type and that you know people aren't putting numbers when they should be putting uh, something like an email address or an address. Um, so having that data validation in a system like NoLoco on both the front end and uh, the back end um, is a better experience overall for, for everybody interacting with the data. And uh, jumping in number five, the, the workflow automation, we had touched on it today, and that's a topic that we'll cover more in our second session, um, mm -hmm. but being able to copy templates over or to take action based on, say, a status that's that's updated, maybe sending an email out. Um, all of that is, uh, I guess, not native specifically to databases, but to a system like Moloco, where mm -hmm. the, the automations are uh, connected to the, the data on the back end. So it makes it simple to put together entire workflows from beginning to end, as opposed to having to cobble things together like you do in, in Google Sheets. Brilliant. I think that's a great last point to finish on and definitely starts to kind of drip feed some of the topics that we will, you know, showcase and build from today in the next session so um yeah i think it's uh yeah it's it's just really opens the door right and um, by having your data in databases built on noloco you can then reap the benefits of a no code app builder like noloco all the workflow tools all the integrations with other tools out there as well um that we mentioned at some points throughout the session so yeah, I think it's a great finish here. And look, Ben, thank you so much for leading today's session. It was really, really insightful. And all I'll say is for those on the line, um, I'll be following up with an email. I'd love to hear your feedback, particularly if you are joining us in the next session, give us some ideas of what you'd like to see. And for anyone tuning into the YouTube video, definitely add some comments below on maybe some ideas you'd like to learn more about having tuned in today. But um. Yeah, thank you so much for your time, Ben, and everyone who tuned in today. I hope you found it uh, a useful session. I most certainly did. Um, and yeah, everyone have a great day all over the world, Jamaica, UAE, <laughs> all the exotic places that everyone's dialing in from. Um, so yeah, I'll leave you there and thank you for your time. Thanks, Jill. We'll see you all later. Great.